How about that? Okay. <laughs> How about that? There we are. How about that? Sitting, listening to music, rocking away. <laughs> oh dear. How are things, my friend? Uh, things are... How are things? How are you? Uh, and, oh, and, yeah. and you know, I would say that uh, the, generally for the last three months I've been okay, but there have been days where I've had enough. I just, I, I haven't felt good at all. No. I think from, from my conversations with people in, in Wales, that your lockdown is much harder, much more strict than we've had here, at least in Massachusetts. For me, the, the, the big day, my, my awful day, was March the 17th, which was um, uh, St. Patrick's Day. And I celebrate St. Patrick's Day uh, um, very uh, specifically here in the States because St. Patrick wasn't Irish, he was Welsh. Legend would have us believe, yeah. Sure. He went to convert the Irish, for goodness sake. And, um, <laughs> you know, and so I always, I, and, and in here we have a boiled dinner sort of thing, which is corned beef and cabbage. I look forward to it every year. I go to the pub every year with my friends and we have corned beef and cabbage with a Guinness. And it's wonderful. It's marvellous. I look forward to it every year. And of course, all the pubs closed, everything closed on St. Patrick's Day. It was horrendous. It was awful. Um, so that was a real, um, that was an eye opener to what was going to come for the next uh, three months or whatever of things closing. My, my, my local restaurants and pubs have got all closed. They're still closed. March the 17th was when lockdown was introduced with you. So, so, yeah, so yeah, it was. From the, yeah. from the UK perspective, there was, there was kind of advice on how we should be, you know, washing things, not touching handles, not going too close to people. And it seemed like that was as the extent of what we were going to get. And then all of a sudden it was, no, tomorrow, no one's allowed to leave their homes. No, no gatherings. You can go out to do essential shopping. But even then, you know, if you spend any time outside for two or three weeks, a lot of people afraid of going out. Um... A lot of people not sure what they'd experience and encounter when they got to the supermarkets and things like that. So just everything that you'd expect to be able to do in life was shut down, cafes, restaurants, all of that. Mm. Um, the only things that kind of continued were supermarkets and deliveries, Amazon deliveries. <laughs> so people adapted really quickly and what have you. But it, it's, it's been in that sense really severe you know, strict uh, in terms of people moving around and the police stopping people and things like that if you're driving too far. You know, every day there was news articles about the police have pulled someone over on the road down to Pembroke and they're, they're on a jolly from, I don't know, Carlisle or something like that and all that sort of stuff. Um, so what, 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 did actually, what has it actually looked like with you guys? What restrictions have been placed on you? And, and the restrictions are different, and, and it hasn't been like that at all, okay? And I, I, I can only speak for Massachusetts, mm -hmm. uh, all right, because every state is different. But uh, for us, it, it did mean there were certain things you couldn't do, um, couldn't go to work, et cetera, et cetera. But the, there have been no real restrictions about going out, when to go out, you know, as time has gone on, um, uh, you, you've got to wear a mask wherever you go. Um, if you go into a shop, you're not going to be served without a mask. Um, so that sort of thing has happened and, and grown. And, and I, I agree with that. That's fair. That's loving your neighbour, for goodness sake. You know, I don't want to give this virus. I want to preach the gospel, not the virus. I don't want to spread the virus. So, you know, for me... Um, uh, I, I wear a mask whenever I, whenever I uh, go to a shop or whatever. We, I had to make a decision um, uh, in, in one sense because 
you know, all these things were, were happening and people said, what do churches do? So I spoke to a number of pastors I'm, I'm familiar with and, and, and they said, you should, you should meet. And I thought, oh, that's ridiculous. We're, we're over. That's nonsense. Of course we can meet. We're okay. It's all right. Within three days, four days, I told my leadership, we can't meet because it's not going to happen. So within a few days, we, I use the word scrambled, um, you know, the, uh, um, uh, like the um, uh, British, um, you know, scrambled, air, you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, uh, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> uh, we, we scrambled and literally got everything together in a day and a half in order to do what we do. I think we overreacted, maybe, maybe. Having said that, we reacted pre the state. The state said, next Sunday you can't meet. We decided not to meet on the Sunday before. And I felt that was a good thing. It was the church saying, we care about the community. We are not here for ourselves, we are here for other people, and we are not going to spread this infection. Mm. So you say in there that you scrambled, um, so that was a decision, first of all, that's a decision you made, but yeah. then it was followed up by the state decreeing, you know, like that's right, yeah. certain sizes are, are off, the, off the cards. Um, so you said that you scrambled kind of what you did then in response yeah. to not being able to meet physically. What has that looked like in your church? Uh, to begin with, I wanted to get as few people in church as possible. It's the only time as a pastor I have ever, ever tried to get less people in church <laughs> each Sunday. So we had four people and that was myself. We had someone um, who would give the announcements. Uh, someone was a cameraman and someone was a sound person. That was it. Um, I didn't want anybody to come in. I didn't want to risk anybody's life with a with virus um, because we have a number of elderly people as well. Uh, slowly but surely, we, we, we pushed that to six or seven coming in and doing, you know, having people on uh, sound and etc now of course we uh, we meet together and uh, you know we have a congregation i tell you it it's it's so interesting preaching to an empty church wow there is nobody there we have um our 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 associate pastor uh, is also a youth pastor and he's great and he's wonderful and he brings this big teddy bear with him huge teddy bear to speak to the kids so of course every sunday i'm preaching to this huge teddy bear i i think he's converted i really do so i, I just preached to a camera i've been yeah. preaching to a camera for, Sun, uh, Sun for the, like broadcasting it live yeah you tried to maintain like how a service feels online exactly I, we try to do i'm trying I'm, I generally, I love to be on the edge, love to be doing different things, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Here, I'm going to be traditional because what people need, I think, during times of stress and crisis is tradition. They need something they're used to. So it's, this is fascinating. This is a challenge. I, I preach every day, every day except for Saturday. You know, I do a daily devotion every day and um, I prepare in the morning, I, we record it and then it goes out in the afternoon. No, that only means keeping in touch with people who are online, right? And not everybody listens to the daily devotion. We have far more people listening on Sunday than our daily devotion. Our daily devotion, um, we would get through Instagram and um, and Facebook Live, averaging 50 people a day who are listening. But then I think, 
wow, that's not bad. You know, I'm, I'm working in the morning. I'm doing a series on Saul at the moment. Of, you know, 10 minutes every day. Just 10 minutes every day. And uh, do you know it's worth it? Just to get people connected. People need connection. You were saying just then about like providence. Yeah. Of um, how God can be at work and how God is at yeah. Even in the midst of a pandemic, pandemic yeah. and a lockdown and things like that, yeah. and believe me, that's the sort of conversations I've been having with all of my pastor buddies in South Wales. Um, yeah. What what sort of opportunities then have you found coming out of the pandemic? Are there any like real the big the big reason? Yeah. Well, I don't know how to say it really. No, I I, I get the question, and and the. Uh, let me start by putting it his, putting it in, in historic context. Um, I, I, I did a series the other day on, on it's the 400 years since the Mayflower came over uh, here to, um, to New England uh, in 1620. And uh, all the celebrations have been put off or whatever. So I de decided to celebrate online or whatever about that. And one of the key things in reading the sources of the Puritan writers, all English Puritans, was that their huge, huge emphasis on providence. Providence for them was not, a, wasn't a theology. It was a life. And they overdid it somewhat. I think they did that. I'm willing to say they overdid it. Having said that, God was in their life from day to day. Whatever happened, they knew that God was there. And for me, that has been a real challenge over the last three weeks. I was studying them just three weeks ago. And uh, I think God comes into our lives in all different sorts of ways. I, how does God use the pandemic? My answer is this, lots of ways, not one way. Is it judgment? It could be for some people. Is it opportunity? Yes. Can we see a silver lining to the cloud? Yes. Let me give you a silver lining. You pr you've probably seen this yourself. As a church, we meet, um, we have about, the number of people who come to our church on a month basis would be around about 150, 170 people, okay? On a month basis. They're not there every week, okay? Our average is about 100, 100 plus every week. We have two congregations. One congregation is Nepali uh, and the other is, um, is English speaking and we have a number of nations, whatever. In that, we, we have seen people come and go, like every church, all right, over the years. During this pandemic, many of the people I haven't seen for 10 years are listening in to the messages and services. Because many of the people who are listening to us now, we have been praying for, for the last year. So is it me being super spiritual? And I'm not super spiritual, but I'm going to be now. I'm just going to throw it in. I think God has answered part of our prayer. And people who we prayed for, we haven't seen, are tuning in again. Will it stay? I don't know. I have no idea. But I believe in God's providence. And that works in all different sorts of ways. I haven't got any easy answers. I'm not trying to pretend everything's okay. And, 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 but I believe God is in control. So you've mentioned then that you've, the lockdown restrictions have lifted enough for you guys to be not just thinking about coming back together, but actually meeting together. We, we actually meet, yes, yeah. For three weeks, yeah. You've had three weeks back physically. Three weeks, But yeah. you, did, you did say that um, not everyone's coming back. So this Not is at all. Not at all. <laughs> let me, let me I, I, I butt in here and say, my imagination, 
and I have a great imagination, which is good and bad, um, a great imagination, uh, was that one day we're all going to get back together again and it's going to be wonderful and everyone's going to be together hugging and kissing and everything is going to be wonderful again and we're all going to be happy singing hymns. Uh, uh, not happening. Uh, really, it's a very slow process. So we have um, our, our, our church has um, uh, pews. We have pews in the church. It's a large church with pews. So you can only sit in any other pew. You can pews always separating people and you're even separated in the pews. You can't sit where you like. Someone takes you to where you, you, you've got to sit. The, all the windows are open. Um, it's, it's very, very guarded very restricted but but the people who come and do you know what's amazing here's the amazing thing do you know the people who come it's not the young people it's the older people it's the people over 65 i tell stay at home don't, don't you don't need to come it's okay they're there they're there they're excited they're they love it and, and they come to me afterwards and you know we stand outside at a greeting thing for uh, distance and <laughs> we stand outside and say oh this was wonderful this was wonderful and you know I think you know we have a tiny percent of our con congregation actually coming back tiny percent there is fellowship going on uh, you know, face-to-face -face fellowship. People have decided to live in their bubbles and th there is a church bubble that people have decided to limit themselves to and that's great and wonderful. Um, so we see that, on, uh, I, I see that every day. But uh, as yet, I, and I don't know what's going to happen. The reality is this, uh, in the next few days, we will see what all the protests have, have, have come to as regards the virus. Mm -hmm. We don't know yet. The impact. The impact. So in Massachusetts, things have gone down. It's wonderful. But they might go up in the next two or three days. Okay. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, I, I can't pretend to be anything but an extrovert. I love people. I love crowds. I love fame. Give me a bit of fame. All right. Give me a bit of this. Give a bit of that. I love it. I love the camera. I love all these things. I'm an extrovert. Um, so for me, this was hard going. This was hard going. This is the extrovert's nightmare. So for me, one of the hard things has been not being able to get together in my book groups, which are key for me. Mm -hmm. For me, literature is, uh, is a lifeline, discussing literature. And um, uh, I, have, I have got together with, 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 with groups. I've got three book groups I'm involved with. And, um, you know, they've disappeared. They've gone. <laughs> they've gone. I can't Zoom. I cannot Zoom a literature meeting with my friends. I can't. I'm sorry. Forget no. that. I need food. I need a drink. I need atmosphere. So of all the stupid things that I'm suffering from, one of them is I can't be with my friends in in discussing literature and discussing life. Ah! <laughs> you know, uh, the thing is, the longer that we've gone into our lockdown, the more I've come to realise that is true. That simply replacing the things that we would normally have done online with videos yeah. can only go so far. Because <laughs> exactly. you're right. You, you meet together with your book club, not to chat about the books um, only, but to, just to be with people. 
and to eat and to enjoy and to laugh and to look and to see and all of that sort of stuff. I've come to realize, and maybe all of us have, but sorry, this is not a theological, uh, um, anthrop anthropomorphical, uh, uh, whatever uh, point, but um, although it is, we need one another. Mm -hmm. Each and every one of us have come to realize that we cannot live by ourselves in some independent uh, existence. I despite my individuality and I think I'm all right, I can survive, I don't need anyone. I need people. Mm. I need my friends. Now, I, I'm, I'm, I'm at, at an, I have an advantage of having, you know, I'm, I'm here with my dear wife and um, uh, a student who lives with us for the last seven years. She's like my daughter. So I come home, I come home to a, a, a full house in one sense. Mm -hmm. And that's wonderful. I go to work. And it's not a full workhouse, but I, I see some people at work, etc., etc. So, but many people haven't got that. They haven't got it at all. As, as you said, I agree with you. It falls short. We need a hug because I am created uh, by God to be social. So that's a hard thing during this time for me. It really is. There is something in a number of people, and I've, I've noticed this, a number of people have said, I, I give one example of one person who's really dedicated to the church. And she said, Do you know, I don't care anymore. I got to get out. I can't, I can't, I can't live by myself. I got to get out. I don't care. In other words, she needs to get out. And that has overcome all her worries about catching anything or being infected. And I understand that. And after three months, a lot of people are going through that. Others, psychologically, are saying, I'm going to hold back. I am not siding with one or the other. But these are human traits. Mm. There is no one answer. The humanity, our humanity demands certain things of us. But it's a human thing. But it's a God thing because God is a humanist. God created us as human beings. And he made us like this. So that's okay to go through as far as I'm concerned. People are longing. Mm. I, let me give you an example. So I, I said earlier that um, I'm involved in three book groups every month. One, uh, I'm, I'm involved in a pastor's book group. I'm involved in a, um, a novel book group, uh, classics book group, and involved in a one-to-one -one, uh, book group with my friend. And we've been meeting together for the last 10 years. For 10 years, we've met together every every Thursday, every last Thursday of the month to discuss a work of literature. Do you know, we tried it on Zoom. Ah, didn't work. We need one another. We need atmosphere. We need food. We need drink. We need intellectual stimulation. We need faces. We need presence. It's part of our, our of how our God has made us. Yeah. And I think there is something here um, uh, uh, for Christians to say at this time, we are made in a certain way. We are not robotic. We are not. I think something else you said then when you were describing your book club with the, you know, like the environment, yeah. the food, the drink, the like non-verbal communication that goes on when you're in a room. Yeah, that's a great word. Non-verbal communication is great. Yeah. I think too often we can reduce what we're about even as Christians down to as information. We've got a message. Yeah. 
if we can share yeah. some information that that'll do the trick but one of the things we've been looking at we, we looked at the start of the year we've discussed it on and off over the last couple of years is is just how much is communicated to us by god through beauty through art and through experience and absolutely I don't, we don't need the bible we need to close our eyes and feel god i don't mean that at all not at all i understand god just yeah. doesn't just tell us the bare facts he he tells us stories the bible has got metaphors oh. with there are oh. lives that you can follow hallelujah hallelujah <laughs> and 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 for me the whole trying to live life through zoom has proven my thinking right in that sense yeah. simply sharing words broken down into bits and bytes sent over cables and then transmitted into my eyes it isn't the same like the information might be there but what i need to understand what i need to feel and process it what i need to be energized and encouraged by it is so much more than just the information it's the it's the whole experience it's the yeah what has it been like in Massachusetts that um, kind of protest wise, Black Lives Matters wise? In the UK, we've seen about stuff happening in um, Texas, um, Minneapolis. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my US geography is fine, but when. Um, no, no going, mine is even worse. So. When it's all going to cities rather than states, I start getting um, confused. So, like, what does it look like? in your state and what would you say about everything that's going on one of the things i would say positively is that uh, in massachusetts it's been peaceful generally speaking tiny exceptions for instance even here uh, i live in ipswich um uh, on the north shore of, of boston and uh, the, the 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 protests here have been people driving in cars <laughs> all right with black lives matter um sort of placarded on their cars tooting horns um most of whom have been white which i think is a wonderful thing and uh, and it's been about young people standing in the square uh shouting out and showing concern for racial issues which i love so uh, in massachusetts we have seen very positive protests. I'm my hero of the civil rights movement is Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Uh, I, I've read him, uh, I read him on a regular basis. I always go to him um, because he was non-violent, he's pacifist uh, in that. I, I, I love his writing, how he managed to keep his morality during that time is incredible and i think anyone if you want to understand true spirituality in social justice form read something just whatever by martin luther king jr he is magnificent is there a call to speak out about social justice absolutely we need as Christians to be forefront in that call, to bring people together, to care. You know, I have, I have about 20 different nations in my church, um, all colors uh, and backgrounds. Uh, people who went through the, um, uh, the killing fields in Cambodia, I've got one family who'd been through that. I've got people who went through the civil war in Liberia uh in church saw saw people killed etc etc all these different sorts of people and i i am concerned that we should be a people of social justice the problem with us as evangelicals has been a an obsession with the beginning of the 20th century uh, with a guy called, do you know, I can never say his name, Rauven Bush or whatever. Forgive me, all right, you will know better than me. Anyway, and he came out with a, a book called The Social Gospel. And in it, he says the kingdom of God needs to be individual and yet communal as well. And of course, 
eventually the social gospel became a very liberal gospel which neglected some of the key teachings that I still believe the centrality of the cross conversion uh, new birth etc etc and, and that that was put to one side and I accept that but then we put aside the whole thing of the social gospel our gospel is a social gospel. It's about people being changed individually and communally. And, and I believe so much that when Christians raise their voices as they did with Wilberforce against slavery, um, uh, as they did with uh, um, um, Fry Elizabeth Fry against uh, prison reform, et cetera, et cetera. It's so important that we are there. We should not give uh, the Me Too movement, for instance, mm. all right, which is which is about sexuality and 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 looking after women. The Me Too movement. Christians aren't involved in it. We should be forefront in involved in it. Black Lives Matter. Christians should be involved in it. These are important key things because we are made in the image of God. But doesn't mean that the social side of our gospel is therefore negates the spiritual side of the gospel. They're all there. Here's the danger, I think, for evangelicals in, in America. In America, uh, firstly, I, I can only speak about America, not Wales. But the danger is this, uh, that, that we're always, when we, when we speak publicly, this is a huge danger. When we speak publicly uh, to the media, to the press, whatever, when we say things publicly in sermons, we're looking over our shoulder at other evangelicals, wondering how they are going to react to what we say. And I'm sorry, please give me a break. I'm going to refuse to play that game. Um, I, I'm old enough to get away with it, you know, um, you're younger, um, uh, whatever. But I'm always wondering, oh, what would so-and-so of the evangelical movement of this or that or, or whatever say about this? Am I giving a wrong impression? Do you know, hard lines, get over it. Because I think there's a boldness in the gospel. And if it's true, I want to bring people with me. I don't want to alienate people. Mm. And one of, one of my key things is to bring people who are far more conservative than I am with me in my views i don't want to alienate them i want to bring them with me and convince them in soul um, of what i believe but at the same time for goodness sake we we mute ourselves by looking at our shoulders what fellow evangelicals are going to say about us and you said Christians should be at the forefront of social justice. Yep. Yeah? Yep. Why? Where have you got that from? Where I got that from? I got <laughs> it from the whole Bible. <laughs> I got it from Ephesians, where the, where, the, where the wall is broken down between Jews and Gentiles, where racism and nationality and pride in nation come secondary to the kingdom of God. My identity is I'm part of the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And that's wonderful and great and exciting. And I, it doesn't matter what my background is, whether I've got this accent or that accent or this colour or that colour. And we need to make that clear. That doesn't mean that you haven't got to work on it. Let me give you an example. In America at the moment, a key new moral word is diversity. Diversity has become a moral word. Mm -hmm. That's a load of nonsense. Total nonsense. Diversity 
isn't something easy and good. It's hard. You've got to work at diversity. It's much easier to be with people who are like you. It's much easier for me to get on with people. If I meet someone from Wales, I'm speaking to you now, we've got so much in common. We've, we've been brought up in Wales, we know Almondford, we, we know some of the same people, we can talk all these different things, we've got things in common, we can talk endlessly. Wonderful. When I meet someone from Nepal, and we've got Nepali congregation, it's a different world. You say, oh, diversity is good. It's good, yeah, but it's hard. You've got to work at it. It's not of necessity good. Because even in diversity, you've got to find community. And this whole word, of, I'm, I'm sick to death of liberals talking about um, uh, diversity is good, diversity is good. Diversity is a challenge we must overcome. Absolutely. We must get on with people we're not. We don't know, we don't know their cultures, we, we need to seek, but it's not easy. And I think as church, we need to say that and be honest about that. Not, not pretend this utter nonsensical moralism of, of, of the liberal wing. I'm not sure, I'm not sure I, I, I even get that end of the argument, but the whole diversity being united when we're from a mixed background, whether that's a racial yeah. thing, education-wise, yeah. even like interest-wise, th that is, is obviously hard. Otherwise, yeah. Paul wouldn't have written about it. <laughs> Absolutely. So he's saying, this is, this is what it can be now in Christ. Mm -hmm. but he's writing into a context where it's not being lived out because that's not what we still, by nature, move towards. When he says there's no longer Jew or Gentile, um, Scythian, Barbarian, you know, mm -hmm. male, female, slave yeah, 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 yeah. divisions, I've got to presume that the reason he's making that point is because when he looks at the church, they're still living as if that is, you know, the case. There are still these difficult boundaries that socially... 100% agreement. Socially is hard to overcome. So... That in that sense, then okay, I get it. The church should be at the forefront of um, social justice on yeah. a kind of yeah. race, nationality, reconciliation thing because it's it's part of how we describe the church, how we mm -hmm. describe what Jesus has done. He's come to unite people from. You, you know, you you go through it, don't you? Um, a Pentecost. There's all the languages being spoken from yeah. like every nation that they it's knew. Great. Of. In yeah. Revelation, you've got all tongues and tribes and languages, you know, mm -hmm. all together worshiping. So it's that picture is clear. So if the church isn't for that and actively pursuing that, then I guess then we've missed a beat. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. That, that and, and, and that's that's simply what I'm saying. I think. Well, I'm going to tell you. I think there's more to us. The social justice side, the reconciliation side, the current climate, than just knowing that, you know, big Bible story, God creates all mankind with dignity mm -hmm. um, in his image, that Jesus came to save all people, you know, that the church is a gathering of those. Mm -hmm. um, I think of things like when Jesus says, answers the question, what's the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, mm -hmm. soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. I think there there's an imperative to us, isn't there? To go out of our way as Christians to involve ourselves in our neighbor's problems. Does that make sense? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I agree with you. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, so it isn't so much just acknowledging you know, okay, well, my family's grown now, whether I like, like it or not, which would be a weird way of putting it anyway, mm -hmm. or God's plans are bigger than my white supremacist plans, but that Jesus is saying, oh, hang on, part of being a human being is that other people's problems become your problems. That just because life is fine and dandy for you at the moment is not for whoever else. Yeah. 
And yeah. that, that should be a problem for you because you're supposed to love your neighbour as yourself. So your neighbour's Absolutely. a problem. And like when Paul says we're, we're to mourn with those who mourn and things like that, that this is like okay. a state of yeah. who we're supposed to be. Yeah. We are supposed to be people who care about humans. We care about injustice. And I think maybe one of the maybe one of the problems is we think of justice in a one-dimensional sense. We see justice as retribution for things that have gone wrong, rather than um, like leveling the playing field. So you've done something wrong. Justice is me making sure that you pay the price. Okay. Yeah. Not that, and that's one D. But I think justice, scriptural justice, is more about pursuing um like, like fairness and um equity for all at a, f- a foundational level so it's not just waiting for someone to step out of line and, and 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 punish them but it's about making sure you know that your weights and your measures are all fair and legal that's justice isn't it yeah if you're not the the poor in your community or, or whoever is the alien the stranger that um back there in the pentateuch speaking about me like actively doing things so that there's a fair level playing field for everyone not just punishing someone if they take advantage of someone else Does that absolutely uh, and, and 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 there i think what what white people in america forget is if they 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 don't have a black skin so my my experience of the police in america is really good they're lovely lovely okay um you know i i was stopped i was going over the limit in in um uh, i was going maybe 45 miles an hour and a 30 mile an hour limit or whatever and, and a policeman stopped me and he was he was delightful he was nice i was honest i said i i was speeding i you know I wasn't thinking and whatever. I, I couldn't have had, a, he let me off. He was great, okay? And, and throughout my life in Wales, I've had very good interactions with the police. Very few negatives, very few. But what I've realized here in the States is that people of a different color have a different experience. And their interactions, are con- they're constantly being stopped and searched. And, you know, the people are, the police don't trust them. And, and this has an effect. So I want to put myself in their shoes. And... With a few negative things I've had with the police, only a few. Uh, if I remember, someone stopped me in Wales <coughs> um, at, at one time, and and the police it was a policewoman, and and she was just a bit sarky. Do you know? It really stayed with me. It was just a one-off, nothing, nothing bad, but it stayed with me. So if that stays with you. Imagine what it's like time and time again for the society you live in to regard you as nothing and as a danger. So we are bringing up uh, the black problem is a white problem. It's a black problem, but it's also a white problem because the way we speak about people of different color, different ethnicity affects them. It, it does that. So we must be careful. If people, the way people treat you is who you are. I am very fortunate in coming to uh, America that I have my Welsh accent. I, I've said it a number of times. And uh, uh, for 17 years, uh, people say, oh, I love your accent. And, you know, I get it all the time, every week. 
the, the awful thing about coming back to Wales is nobody comments on my accent. Nobody it's can. terrible. It's terrible. I, I feel lost. I'm longing to get back to America where people are going, oh, that's so lovely. And do you know the reality? It makes an effect on you. It affects you. You feel better because people are saying nice things about you. It's a stupid thing. It's a small thing. But can you imagine if, if that accent was awful and people were saying awful things every time you opened your mouth? You're going to grow up in a certain way. That is systemic. That, that is something, it's not just individual little things, it's part of a culture. And that's, and that's my worry. Uh, and that's where I think the church needs to get involved in, in bringing people on board, in uh, speaking highly of people of, uh, people of, of different race, we try and do that on a regular basis in church. But it takes time. And that's not even straightforward. So let me give you, give you an example. So if you ask me this question and, and, and you say, how many people of colour do you have on your leadership team? I'd have to say, at the moment, I've just got one Cambodian. And you say, oh, well, you should have some more, um, some more people. I, w I would answer and I'd say, well, do you know the reality? I've asked a number of people, but they have so many jobs, they haven't got the time. They've got three jobs just to keep alive. They can't give the time. So there's all sorts of things happening. And it's, it's easy to be critical. It's easy to be negative. Uh, it's easy to boil it down to one thing. It's not one thing. It's a pile of things. And we need somehow to try and deal with those. Yeah, uh, it is. It's mind boggling when you start thinking of all the various issues. It, yeah. The other, other obstacles that stand in the way of doing something that you would class as being tangible and helping. Yeah. Right. Well, Mr. Adams. Or Reverend yep. Adams, I don't know what I, <laughs> I don't call me what you like. Pastor, yeah. yeah. Hey there, Pastor Care. <laughs> Let me just say this has been so much fun. And um on on another level, just to say how thrilled I am that the church is going on so well and that the work you're doing, uh that Jonathan and you did and, and whatever, uh, you didn't continue the work I did. You bettered it. You didn't continue it. You bettered it. And um, the church wouldn't be where it is um, if I was still there. And I'm so thankful that God took me away and gave, and gave other people um, guidance and leadership to make the church what it is today. And for me, I tell you, I am so proud of that church. It's wonderful. So thank you.